This is Dave from the Wolf's Den Studio saying welcome to Wolf Spirit Radio. Wolf Spirit Radio is totally listener supported by folks like you who choose to help us stay on the air and grow. Hello, everyone. This is Jennifer Hellman, and this is Air. We are back with Anthony Stone, who Dark Stone, is. Yeah. <laughs> Dark Stone, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you are. He's a, he is a spiritual teacher and musician. I keep saying what you are a musician because sound is so important to you. It's like well, I, all I, I am, your I, energy. I am, I am kind of. I, I do them a bit. I'm a percussionist. And I have been known under the right circumstances to sing a few blues numbers, too. <laughs> yes, well. So, that's, you know, but I wouldn't call myself a musician in the strict sense of the word, no. <laughs> but uh, one thing I've got to con- correct on there, Jen, if I may again. Oh, my Please. Lord, look at this. I'm coming on your show and correcting you. Forgive me, but it, it's important. You know, I don't really describe myself as a teacher. Uh, okay. I don't really think I have anything to teach anybody. I really don't. I would much prefer to be known as a guide, if you like. Um, sort of saying, well, here's the map. Over there's the water. Right over there is a cactus that you can eat. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And then let people do their own walk, so to speak. Um, okay. I'm not really there to teach or to expound any great philosophies. Because uh, all I'm all I'm there to do is to say, look, if there's anything that I can teach you, is for God's sakes, or anybody's sakes, the universe's sakes, Creator's sakes, your own sake, be iconoclastic. Ask the questions. Don't just accept, as Jason was saying, the subliminal hype and spin. So much of that has destroyed this planet, and will continue to do so until people. Say, wait a minute. Why? How? Where did that come from? Who said this? So many things we believe today are rooted in fiction. Because they've been around so long, we imagine them to be true. Um, I don't purport to follow any particular religion. Um, I have my own spirituality. But, for example, the 25th of December has about as much as... Um, to do with the birth of the Christos as, oh, I don't know, pick any example or metaphor you like. Um, right. He was no more visited by three wise men than by three, you know, elephants. Uh, there were 27 Magi who visited the infant. They did this well after the night of his birth. And nine of those 27 Magi were women. And it's very important, and you and I have spoken on this before, I think this new world that Jason is speaking of, or, let me rephrase that if I may, remembering the old world, remembering what we do know, not what we're supposed to learn, but what we have forgotten, is really now for all of us to surrender to the sacred feminine. Because that is really, for want of a better expression, the salvation of the planet. Uh, during the break, we were having a delightful conversation um, with, with another gentleman, and he was talking about the Akela, the, 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 the wolf pack mother, uh, Akela from uh, Kipling. If you look at matriarchal societies like elephants, if you look at the history of this planet, every single queen or female prime minister or president has actually done some good, tangible good. Um, you and I have spoken about this, and uh, sometimes I cause a lot of controversy by saying this, but I will anyway. Why on earth do so many women spend so much of their time trying to be equal to men? They're not. The reason they're not is because they're superior. They really are. It's that simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I know it's been a patriarchal, male-dominated society, etc., 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 but... Now, here's the opportunity for women to claim that sacredness, that that superiority. I don't mean superior in the sense of dictatorial or in any sense commanding or dominant. But there's a gentleness that Jason touched on Mm -hmm. that is sacred. It's feminine. What else 
on this planet can give life. It doesn't really matter whether someone is birthed a child or not. It's within every woman the sacredness of being able to do that. Yes, I understand it needs the male seed, etc., 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 but at the end of the day, it's a staggering thing for us arrogant males to stop and consider. If every male on this planet, including, you know, a babe in arms, died, the world would still continue because the sacred feminine carries enough. Uh, there are enough pregnant women to give birth. It's mm -hmm. a staggering thought. It's a staggering thought. So, the sacredness permeates through all the ancient cultures, and I'm talking about thousands of years ago in the Egyptian culture, the Bhagavad Gita from Hinduism to Native American spirituality uh, to ancient Shinto in Japan, pretty much anywhere. And if we think, just for a brief moment, every single great philosopher teacher had, in one form or another, the sacred feminine to accompany him in the background. Consider for a moment that there isn't a single human embryo that does not begin as female. It's quite a staggering thought. Mm -hmm. Later on, the chromosomes change, and what is the clitoris descends becomes a penis, the ovaries become the testes, etc. But it all begins as female. Now, that's quite a staggering thing. And us men need to understand that. How are we going to understand the sacredness of femininity? Well, basically, I think it's women to teachers. I've been very fortunate for having some remarkable women in my life, my mothers, my grandmothers, my great aunt Alice. Um, if I can use a Native American expression, they were all great medicine people. They were gentle people. They did not dictate. They taught. One of my grandmothers would actually, when I was a child, and just about toddle, would always move me gently to the outside whenever we walked. Until this day, I find it somewhat awkward to walk with a lady if I'm not on the outside. It's nothing to do with male protection. It's just good manners. Right. It's just good manners. Now, I was, I was done. I was taught this gently. So this is what I'm saying. I have a passionate love affair, as you know, with Rosalind, which you wanted me to talk about later on. And that leads me into um, a talk that I'm going to give at the gathering, and I've given before, called Nurturing the Goddess and the, the Magdalene. But anyway, I think you, you probably have some other areas you want to go into now. <laughs> well, it's, it, I mean, the, the goddess energy is so prevalent now. It is, I, I talk to so many women who are noticing that that essence is truly getting amped up and yeah. a lot of the conflict of being working in that male energy in the, the workforce and having to work in the good old boy energy. Yep. In fact, I, as I mentioned to you last week, I had a show on the program because it's such an important issue to speak about these days and right. allow that essence to come forward and find that balance within you to have that strength that you can take into the workplace and truly be authentic. Well, this is true, because what if, let's just say, you know, everybody had a dream, everybody. Well, not everybody can give birth to it. And I have a remarkable, dearly beloved friend who describes herself as a dream midwife. What a wonderful way to describe. To, to aid the planet. She can help people to realize this dream. It doesn't mean that, you know, you sit down and talk to her and she's going to say to you, dream about this and dream about that. Yeah? But it's just literally a dream midwife. I mean, what a wonderful phrase, don't you think? Yes, it's, it is. It's a beautiful phrase. Yeah? Having, having, having a dream is one thing, but then you need to learn how to do it. It's like a lot of people, as you and I have spoken before, go, okay, I want to go out and help the world. Fine. How? Well, if you haven't got everything together, then you can't. You can walk past a homeless person on the street, feel sorry for him, and even compassion, and want to be able to give him five bucks for a meal and a cup of coffee. But if you don't have five bucks, it ain't going to happen. Exactly. So any philosophy that we do today 
in my humble opinion, needs to be one that's practical. Um, it's all very well to jump up and down and say, I'm a spiritual person and I do this and I want this and I want to change that. But as Jason rightly pointed out, if he didn't paint a painting or compose a piece of music, then he's not going to touch anybody. He spoke about the intent and he spoke, if I remember rightly, about the paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Well, to have a paradigm shift, we need to get rid of this egocentric, unnecessary misconception of masculinity. Masculinity is not being able to go around beating up somebody or blow someone up. It's, as he spoke, it takes a great deal of strength in masculinity to be gentle. I mean, I'm quite happy to admit it before, and I'll admit it openly in the air publicly. I'm a red-blooded male. and Yeah, I love women, absolutely. Yeah, fine. Um, but, nevertheless, I have to admit, after some almost 66 summers on this planet, that the older I get, the more wisdom I seem to be seeing coming from this sacred feminine. And I'm learning to say to myself, hey, you know what, Anthony, just shut up and listen. These women have something to tell you. They have something to teach you. All my life they've done that. Um, you may sound, you may, I may sound somewhat crazy, but my inner circle, close circle of friends know that I'm not when I'm about, when I say what I'm about to say live on the air, is the Magdalene walks with me. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And if anybody had a bad rap through history, I mean, she did. Definitely. The, Christ, the Christos could not come into his divinity if it wasn't for her. I mean, some say that, you know, she still walks the earth. She's immortal. Um, I tend to possibly side with that, but that's a topic for another discussion another time. But suffice to say that she played an essential role. Consider, if you will, when a gentleman called Uranus decided he would put together what we call the Bible, he borrowed heavily from the ancient uh, Jewish books, and created the Old Testament, and then the New Testament, and conveniently decided, well, you know, I think I'd like to edit this, and I'll leave mm -hmm. out some stuff. One of the things he left out, apart from the Gospel of Thomas, was the Gospel of the Magdalene. Now, from where I'm sitting, I would have thought, irrespective of what somebody's belief and religious system is, that if and when the Christos, and again, this is up to someone's belief. I'm merely using this as an example. When he rose, all the good old boys who hung out with him for three years, you know, they were scared in the room someplace. She was the one who went over to see if everything was okay. And she was the first human he showed himself to. That's really quite something to stop and take in. It really is. Um, and... The wisdom that she shared and, um, I mean, she really was the, the goddess in all ways. I mean, she was there to support whoever needed the support. She was there supporting Jesus, but yet she held her own. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So this sacred feminine, I think, in, from my viewpoint, um, having studied and learned and read various things, is becoming more and more relevant to me to be able to say, wow, this is something that's really happening on this planet. And if we're smart, if we're smart, at this moment in time, we have the dream midwives, we have the intuitive photographers, we have the musicians, we have wonderful ladies like yourself, like yourself, who encapsulate this essence of the sacred feminine. If we look back into all the cultures, way back into ancient Egypt, we find this. If we look in Native American culture, if we look into, as I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. on, any of the cultures around the planet, the sacred feminine is the fulcrum. It's the pivotal being, if you like, the essence of everything. It truly is. And there was a major turning point when... Um, I think the, the sacred feminine has always been respected in some sense, but it wasn't emphasized or really focused upon, um, for a few, a few thousand, a few hundred years at least. And it, that's when things kind of got twisted in the way that the nature 
has been developed and the countries have been um, developed, it's it's really taken away from nurturing the world to what can we take away from the world. And I think it's now shifting back to a more, a better balance for the world and for humanity and nature. I think the key word that you used there was balance, uh, to create this harmony. Because when we look what most people consider to be the surface symbol now, which started out in L.A., it's actually the intertwining fish symbol of the Tao, uh, going back thousands of years. And before mm-hmm. that symbol, there was the other one. Um, it's not a duality. It's a combination of the two. The yes. divine masculine and the sacred feminine. It's, it's, a, it's a combination to create not so much a hermaphrodite or anything like that. It's what Carl, Dr. Carl Jung described as the anima animus. Mm-hmm. Um, how can I best put this? An example that I'd like to use and I have used in the past is the purpose of a caterpillar is not to become a bigger, fatter, richer caterpillar, but to be still, fall asleep, and transform into a beautiful butterfly. It's this transformation that I'm passionate about. It's this transformation that I'm saying, hey, people, you know, as Jason was saying earlier on, so rightly, this is what we need to grasp. We've got a second chance. We've got a second chance. We need to grasp that. We need to be able to say, and, you know, let's be very fair as well. It's not just the men. I mean, there are women who have forgotten. Oh, Definitely. That they have, the, you know, I've got nothing against women, but there are women who've forgotten that. You, you know, I, I, I clearly remember uh, my mother, my grandmothers. They were perfectly capable of opening a jar, but they would come over to, you know, an eleven or twelve year old boy and say, "Here, can you help me, son?" And I would open it, and I would feel really good. Now, mm-hmm. that was a kind of nurturing. Years later, I understood that they cared enough to make me feel important. And, you know, any wise woman knows this. Any wise woman really knows this. Yes. Um, you know, us guys don't really have a chance against a wise woman. <laughs> she, 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 Very really, true. Very so true. My, my attitude to it is, hey, you know what? Just just go with it because they're going to love you. They're going to take care of you. They're going to they're gonna nurture you. They're going to you do it. And in turn, we need to nurture that goddess. We need to, if you like, pay obeisance to um, the sacredness of the feminine. Because without it, what on earth can we do? Nothing. Exactly. Really, nothing. The greatest right. warrior, the greatest warrior needs to go out. Who's going to tend his wounds or braid his hair or, you know, take care of his armor or give him his sword or whatever? That doesn't mean that a woman cannot fight alongside and be a warrior. You know, you've got Conan and Red Sonia, for example. But, they just, just, just an example, uh, you know, out of nowhere. They both fought alongside, back to back, etc. But there was this melding, if you like, right. And that, to me, is in a sense almost oh, dare I use the word here, tantric or beyond tantric. Um, that's the kind of melding. It's a spiritual joining. It, it's a spiritual. Um, it's not really creating another entity. That's not what I'm trying to get across. It's uh, it's turning it into a spiral energy that connects with God, creation, Allah, whatever you want to call it. And inter- interestingly, I don't know, you know, some people may know this already, um, but I discovered this a few years ago if um, by reading a lot of the Sifu, uh, uh, Sufi teachings. Um, much of the wisdom that we know today goes back to Sufi teachings. And right. <laughs> as you know, Janet, there's a lot of people quoting Rumi all over Facebook. Uh, and he was one of the great Sufi teachers. I don't yes. know if they realize that. The very word Allah and the way it's pronounced actually means... She who should be obeyed. That's what it means. It's not just some, you know, Islamic term referring to God. Well, it is, but I mean no disrespect to anybody or their belief. But the origins of Allah and the way it's pronounced is she who has to be obeyed. And this is why I think, um, oh, what was the name of the man? It, it, it's gone out of my head now. Ryder Haggard, yeah, who wrote King Solomon's Minds. He 
wrote this wonderful book called She. And mm-hmm. I heartily recommend anyone to go down to the library. And there's a couple of movies out. Uh, the original one was with Ursula Andress, uh, produced by her husband then, John Derrick, which gives you a nice overview. And But, you know, I, I heartily recommend anybody to go and read this book by um, um, uh, writer Haggard, who, who wrote this, She, She Who Should Be Obeyed. It's, it's, it is a beautiful, beautiful book and movie. Um, there's so many things that have pointed in to the strength of the sacred feminine. I mean, it, back to something else Jason said is nature is showing us how to correct things. And we're kind of like destroying nature, our own teachers. Mm. To me, the, the strongest mm. teachers, the most powerful teachers I've had have mm-hmm. been a tree, mm-hmm. my dogs, mm-hmm. nature overall. And I've always connected to it. In fact, I was talking to another um, of the the, um, radio hosts, and we were saying about the Santa Ana winds in California, that they're Uh magical. And how uh, I was a kid, and I'd just go outside, and I'd melt into this wind because it just was, there was just an energy to it that just, even though it's really powerful, it really took you somewhere. Within yeah, yourself. It's, it's just incredible. The breath of spirit, basically. Basically. Yeah. yeah, it's the breath of spirit. I mean, you touched on a word there, uh, magical, and you, you mentioned that earlier on in, um, in, 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 in the show when we started. Um, yes, I'm involved in show business, and I produce and do things on TV and things like that. I'm a consultant and done my radio shows and things, as you well know. Um, but I still perform as a magical entertainer. Uh, no, I do not pull rabbits out of hats or, you know, doves um, out of thin air or anything like that. My magic is more the magic of the mind, if you like. Um, and I hasten to add very quickly, I don't have any special powers. I'm an entertainer. However, within the entertainer, um, I understand the nature of illusion. And many people think, oh, just because you're in show business, how can you possibly know stuff or be spiritual? Well, the short answer to that is, well, take a look at Shirley MacLaine, Chief right. Dan George, great actor. Um, he was in The Outlaw, Josie Wales, and a number of other things. And, of course, Grandpa Floyd Red Crow Westerman, who played guitar, he sang, and brought to the world some ancient Lakota knowledge uh, that the Lakota people knew the trees and human beings shared the same DNA. Well, of course, they didn't have words like DNA three or four hundred years ago. But interesting, is it not? Um, I believe, and I'll stand corrected, it was either Harvard or, or Columbia Medical School that actually made this discovery. I mean, that's quite a stretch. You, know, you say a human has the same DNA as a pig, and go, yeah, okay, skin, blood, nose, eyes, right. yeah, okay. It's a stretch, but a tree? But like you and I, who've understood about standing people, you and I who've hugged a tree, you and I who've sat under a tree. We mentioned Michelle Morgan Flowers earlier on, where she is um, based in the hospital on, in, in, in Diné land on the Navajo Reservation. She regularly goes up to her favorite tree to meditate and pray. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, trees, and as Jason was saying, roots, absolutely, they have power. Definitely. They have power. They're sacred. I, They're connected to the earth. I, I actually had a guest, um, Elisa Novik, and mm-hmm. that's she's all about trees and listening to the trees and expressing the wisdom of the trees. And she's a beautiful soul that now is doing a world tour, teaching people how to connect with trees. Okay. So it's it, the elements of and the people to help us get better connected are now really coming up and out and coming out of the cave and saying, let me show you how you can better understand yourself through this tool or through this. Um, I don't like even say tool. I just, I think of nature or the essence of, of nature is just magic. It's just, it's spirit. It's it, just, it, it is. it's truth. And, and it's, yes. it's, really something that um I know when I've been cooped in too long when I just I want to feel the breeze I want to feel so I always take a walk 
um, as much as possible. Um, it inspires me. So there has been many things that have inspired you. You mentioned to me about Rosalind Chapel, who I is a beautiful space. There. It was under construction when I visited it, uh-huh. um, and it actually asked me to leave. Um, oh. It was interesting. It actually, the energy of it, I was standing near a wall, and I literally felt it attempting to suck me into the wall. Well, that it does. (laughs) Um, And I went to one of the posts because my friend that I was traveling, Peggy, goes, God, I can't hear when I'm next to this post, this column. And I'm going, that's really weird. So I went there and the column said, it's dangerous for you. It's time for you to leave. And I said, okay, had enough. And I walked outside and I stayed outside where she looked around. Well, um, how much time do we have? Uh, And I'll need to, you know, and I'll. We have about 25 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's fine. It gives me an idea of how much I can, I can tell you about that. Well, let, let's, let, let's start at the beginning, which is always a good place for any story, isn't it? <laughs> um, as I mentioned, I'm a magical entertainer and a very good friend of mine, Jay Scott Berry, uh, some years ago turned and called me up and he said, listen, um, uh, T, he always calls me T, my inner circle do, because Anthony, Tony, and they just call me T. He said, look, I need you to do something. And I said, okay, what's that? And he's a very spiritual being, by the way, and a world famous musician and magical entertainer. Um, and I said, what's that? And he said, well, I'm in Scotland at the moment, and we're putting together this amazing show over the weekend, uh, that I want you to come up with a new character. And do this. So I said, okay, fine. Well, after much thought, fast forward the tape. Um, I created a character called Zadok, Keeper of the Seal, the Ancient Magi. Uh, and Zadok, as some of your listeners may know, or Zadok, as he's pronounced in Hebrew, was the high priest to King David and his son Solomon. Um, and Handel later on wrote uh, a piece of music called Zadok the Priest, which was played at the coronation of George II, I believe, in England and Consequent, subsequently played for every other, every coronation after that for the sovereign. So fast forward this, and whilst I was there, I met this amazing guy that we became great friends with called Mark Fiskin. And um, Mark played the part of a two and a half thousand year old wizard. And we had a glorious weekend and an audience that came in and out over the weekend, some 12,000 people in total. I mean, it was magical, really. I can't think of another word. Fast forward this a year later, Mark invites me to his home in Scotland, and I'm doing a lecture tour and talks, etc. And I said to him, look, do you think there's any possibility that in between all this time, we can devote some time to Rosalind Chapel? To which Mark says to me, yeah, no problem. I thought you'd seen it. I said, no, I haven't. In 1982, I read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, fascinated by the topic, the Magdalene, etc., uh, and the, line- the lineage of the Christos and so forth, um, never been to the chapel, looked to do it. And he said, well, we'll get you there, and we'll give you a VIP tour and so on. And I thought he was kidding. You know, friends do. But, you know, they right. say things and so on. Particularly in showbiz, you kid each other, you know, about all kinds of things. And I said, oh, sure, while you're at it, Mark, why don't I have a cup of tea with the curator? Now, where did I get this from? When I read the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown had had his hero in the book, the central character, meet with a lady curator in the chapel, based on his experience of meeting a lady curator. This is very important. Bear with me, please. It sounds a little boring. But please bear with me for a moment. So, hence, I said, let me meet the lady curator, to which Mark, cu- curator, I beg your pardon, curator. So, Mark turns to me and he says, why? You've met her. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you remember last year we had, you know, the black tie dinner, tuxedos, the whole thing, the Queen's representative. I said, yeah, I remember all that. Um, what are you talking about? Well, cut a long story short. At that table, at that dinner a year ago, was myself, my son, uh, Mark, his mom and dad. And it turned out his mother... Judith was the lady curator of Rosalind Chapel. I mean, how, <laughs> just kind of like, wow. Yeah, no said, kidding. No, sure, I'll take you over. She no longer is there. And I said, no, I know she's not because she's the director of Falkland Palace where, you know, we did our big gig that weekend. So we get there and, well, I can't possibly put it into words, but 
we drove down, and I'm a wordsmith, and, you know, I, I know how to talk on radio and give speeches, but I was dumbstruck as we drove down to see it. You yourself will know this as you approach it. Mm -hmm. This icon of absolute meld of enigma and the esoteric. Just seeing it. Well, needless to say, we got there, and I did get a VIP tour. And he did introduce me to the then curator, who still is, Stuart, a wonderful man, who, after we looked around, and I was going to go downstairs, and then Mark said, you go by yourself. I said, what are you talking about? You, you go by yourself. I said, yeah, but you know this place. Because he lived in the cottage next door, and as a young boy, would run around there and play in the chapel, because his mother was the curator. And... Long story short, he would not go downstairs because he was terrified when he was a child. So when you say something says to you, get out of here, <laughs> I know what you mean. This is Mark yeah. who lived there. Um, I went downstairs, and I have to be honest, I didn't feel anything. I, you know, it, it was fine, and I came back up. But the chapel itself is more than an enigma. It's constructed around the 1300s by what's now known as the Sinclair family from Saint Clair, mm -hmm. Saint Graal, Holy Grail, yes, Holy Blood. Yes. Um, and they were also connected, apart from Scotland, they were also lords in Norway, which then connected them to the Yggdrasil tree, which is carved in stone in the chapel. And the Yggdrasil mm -hmm. tree is connected to the Kabbalah, the Kabbalistic yeah. tree of life. I don't mean the, you know, more popular version. I'm talking about the true teachings of it. So that's that. Also in the chapel, there are literally a couple of thousand stone carvings. Some of those stone carvings are vegetables. One of those vegetables is corn. To which mm -hmm. you might say, okay, Anthony, so what? Well, here's so what. Those stone carvings were carved in the 1300s, 200 years before Columbus or anybody else set foot in America, which at that time was the only place that had corn. Yeah. So it's not beyond a stretch of imagination in records of St. Shoners that the Norwegians and what we now know as Scandinavia and Laplanders, etc., had crossed into the Americas well into the, 13, uh, the, uh, the 14th century. So those, that, that in itself is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful tribute to this marvelous place. It, it, it is said. It, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it, it's, it, I just wanted to say the carvings in that chapel are just phenomenal. I mean, there's such details and in the chapel they mention about the corn and there's mm -hmm. some that even are cactus and it's just like, Okay, what does cactus have to do with this? Um, yep. But there really is, like, almost a very futuristic um, trip that you go through as you walk through this. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the more fascinating thing about it, that, that's one part of the chapel. In the 1800s, in the Victorian era, they put up some stained glass windows, quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, until this day, no one knows who paid for it. And no one knows who constructed them. Two of the stained glass windows, which I'd like to touch on briefly here, one is the Archangel Michael, mm -hmm. and the other is of St. Mauritius. It's interesting if people understand about uh, things Masonic, shall we say, um, that there is great relevance, uh, relevance in the relevance rather in the stone carvings, and to many of, shall we say, uh, Masonic schools of thought. Mm -hmm. The platform on which the Archangel Michael is standing is very significant to anybody who understands about Masonic things. It is not for me to speak it publicly. Next to him is St. Mauritius, and this is a personal fascination of mine, because St. Mauritius was part of the Thebian Legion from Thebes, and he had his legion of 600 men, and they served the Romans, hence were known as the Thebian Legion. Mm -hmm. They were all, at that time, Christians. Uh, not as we know them today, Christians, but you know, Christians at that time, in the Roman times. And they were 
asked to sacrifice the Roman gods, and they refused. And they were therefore condemned to death. So all the officers, rather than have the Romans behead their men, beheaded their own men. And mm-hmm. then the last one left, St. Mauritius, fell on his sword. To which people might say, yeah, interesting, what's that got to do with the chapel? Well, quite a lot. Because Mauritius at one stage actually held the lance that is known as the Spear of Longinus. Hmm. Who was Longinus? Well, Longinus was the centurion who pierced the side of the Christos. Ordinarily, um, they would use a short spear, uh, we call it close tactical fighting spear in Romans. If anyone who studied Roman crucifixion techniques or battle history will know what I'm talking about, or battle tactics. They used this big lance. They turned it round because the shaft of the lance was almost like a big wooden mallet, and they would break the kneecaps of anyone that was crucified, so the person would collapse on their own lungs, not be able to breathe, and asphyxiate. So more people died of asphyxiation than actually of the crucifixion. Right. Contrary to popular belief, and I said this earlier on about how things along the centuries, you know, come along, the nails were not put into the palms of the hands of anyone in crucifixion. They were put through the wrists, particularly for the Christos, mm-hmm. because the prophecy of Isaiah said, not a single bone of my body will be broken. So when the Christos was crucified, and trust me, I won't go into it, I have studied many years on women crucifixion techniques, the nails went through his wrists because it doesn't break any bones and you don't fall off. If you put it through your palms, you would just literally fall off. Um, so, and Longinus, coming back to Longinus, used this spear. And anyone who's watched TV programs, uh, and you don't need to be an author who will slow out in your lungs. Fast forward now to the soldiers on duty at crucifixion. Roman history tells us uh, very clearly that the people who had crucifixion detail were pretty much useless as soldiers. Judea was a terrible province to be in. It was the pits of the earth. The governor Pilate did not want to be there. The soldiers had to sustain themselves. They were allowed to wear the uniform of the Roman soldiers, but not to be in the barracks or be known as fighting soldiers. They were given crucifixion detail. They had no money, which is why they always gambled for the clothes Mm -hmm. that whoever they brought up, hence the throwing of dice. They were all either wounded or, you know, had one leg or limbs missing or something like that. Longinus had cataracts. When he pierced the side... Hi, everyone. We're having technical difficulties with Anthony. We'll get him back on. Um, He uh, fascinating experiences um, all over the world. He is actually based in, in Europe. So it is very fascinating to me that he has such. So we're trying Hello. to call him back. He's hey. back. We Welcome, Welcome back, back, Anthony. Yeah, we did. We had one of those technical glitches. Doesn't surprise me. It something always happens every time I talk about Longinus and the spear. Doesn't surprise me. I have no idea why, and I've spoken about this all over the place and uh, different countries in the world. But anyway, there we are. Um, so. It, this, this is fascinating. What has all this got to do, in fact, with you know the modern world we're living in? Well, quite a lot. I'm, I'm, you, am I still coming through? Okay. You're coming through, and oh, we okay. got about I, ten minutes to go. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll wrap this really quickly. What has all this got to do with the modern world? Well, when a particular child was about ten years old, he went to the museum in Vienna, and he saw the spear there. He made a vow that he wanted the spear because he wanted to be immortal. He then grew up, and he was an Austrian. He then became the Chancellor of Germany, which is very difficult for an Austrian to do. Mm-hmm. He then declared war and did get the spear. His name was Adolf Hitler. Uh, and you can Google this, and there's the name of a U.S. private who managed to get the spear back and give it to General Patton, but actually there is some information on Google. I know I don't trust the Internet, but this information is reasonably accurate. Within 15 minutes of this soldier handing the spear back to, uh, handing the spear to General Patton, uh, Hitler shot himself in the bunker. 
Um, and as some people may, may know, that Hitler was very deep into occult and various things. And the sequel to that is there are now two spears in existence. One is back in the museum in Vienna in Austria, and the other is in the Vatican. Which one is real? I have no idea. Are they both fake? Is one of them a fake? Is one of them real? I don't know. But the connection to Ruslan is very important. It is said that at the same time, some of that blood came onto the Magdalene because everybody ran off. His buddies just took off. And they were terrified. She stood there at the foot of mm-hmm. the cross, his mother, who was not, you know, a little peasant girl. She was from the Essene community and a very intelligent woman and actually taught her son many, many things before he came into his divinity, if you like. So all of this links with Ruslan and brings us firmly back to why this sacred female essence, this sacred feminine, is of great importance and why I believe passionately, as do my other brothers in an organization I belong to, that this is where this planet is going to have its salvation. Yes. Do you think the energy of Rosalind is increasing as the feminine energy is increasing? Do you think there's certain space, there's certain sacred places in the world that are amplifying even more so to help the earth kind of regain that balance? In answer to your question, is a resounding yes? Because we must remember as well, and of course I can't go into everything in, in, in a short space of time here. I'm merely kind of headlining a few things, as you know, Jen. Um, it's the sacred geometry. The ley lines that come from Roslyn to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And the entire night sky of Santiago de Compostela, which goes back to the Middle Ages, is mm-hmm. actually in stone in Roslyn. So. Wow. There are questions, and it's good to ask questions. Uh, the question you just asked me, my answer, was sounding yes, absolutely. Let us, let us pay homage to the sacred feminine. We must. Uh, this will be part of my talk uh, at, at the gathering in, mm-hmm. in Arizona. Um, so, yes, and indeed. That, uh, and that is at Window Rock, Arizona. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Now, Somebody in the, um, you started a story and you said, um, the spear pierced his side and then we lost you. So oh, right. a lot of people oh, are okay. saying, okay, well, what happened when he <laughs> pierced his side? Real, I'm missing real quick. something oh, here. Okay, I see that. So real, I just, real, I, I just real quick, if you could go over that, real quick, I think a lot of quick. people would be. Real quick. Um, uh, I'll just repeat very quickly. Anybody that has studied um, medicine or medical science or you know medical examiners, anybody like that, if you pierce uh, between the ribs of any human, blood, uh, lung fluid, and water, lung fluid also, will spill out. So when the side was pierced, no bones were broken, the blood and water splashed onto Longinus, who had cataracts. If you recall, I said people right. on crucifixion detail were like the dregs of the army and couldn't survive any other way. Um, well, he had cataracts, he was cured, and it is said that he was immortal, and he still walks the earth. Uh, there were some good TV programs based on that uh, at one time, relatively good. Um, now, you know, like a lot of these esoteric things, people either go, oh, well, that's nonsense, or if they bother to check, they may well find that it is not nonsense. Um, my own feeling is, and, and I always say this to people, no matter where I talk or what I say, I always say to them, you know what? Don't follow me. I'm not going to lead you any place. I don't teach you anything. In fact, I insist you treat me with total skepticism. Don't believe a damn word that I'm saying. I want you to go out and spend the best part of 40, 50 years researching, checking like I have done. Then come back and tell me I'm wrong. Go and check. This is my purpose. My purpose is not to convince you, persuade you into a a belief. My purpose is simply to act as a catalyst, to stimulate your thinking. If you like, stimulate your emotions to get you passionate and say, no, that can't be right. Right. Please don't look at it. It's like these three kings I spoke about earlier on. 
Nowhere in any holy book, including the Bible, does it say three kings visited the Christos and the infant on the night of his birth. It doesn't. It's just, just not there. It's just not there. So these kind of carelessness with the truth is what has, in a way, begun to destroy our planet. By asking questions, Jason phrased this very well. He talked about, you know, subliminal and hype and spin earlier on. And this is what's happened to us over, over the last few centuries. We've become to believe, okay, you know, Father Christmas is a guy in a red suit, etc. Well, he started out as a icon for Coca-Cola. That's why he's dressed in red and white. You know, it's that simple. And then St. Nicholas got brought into the act, and before you know it, you know, he, he was the epitome of Christmas. Queen Victoria decided to send a few cards at Christmas to some friends, and that's when Christmas cards started, because everybody wanted to be chic and send out Christmas cards. So, right. you know, <laughs> there's a lot okay. of this carelessness with the truth. Anyway, I think we, we're probably coming to the end of that. Wonderful ten minutes. We, we got a couple. We got we got ten minutes. We got like five minutes. But I got to ask you this question: As you were in Rosalind, and you said, "Well, of course, I'm not surprised." Why was it trying to suck me into the wall? <laughs> I'm oh, curious. I, oh my goodness, Jen! I think I'd probably answer you with that off air. Okay. Really will, I really okay. will. Off That's air. why, because it was it was really amazing, and it's like. They didn't bother Peggy at all, my friend I was traveling with. Um, uh-huh. That whole trip was really interesting. This is the first time I met Peggy ever. I talked to her for like three years online, and I said, well, I'm going to Scotland. She goes, oh, can I go on a course? <laughs> and now we're like the best of friends. Um, so it, I, it was I, it, I, an interesting experience, and I do highly recommend going there because it being oh, there absolutely. is it's the gardens are beautiful the building is incredible the the details in the architecture and the the carvings are just yep. phenomenal yep. so yep. um i, I, I definitely very, absolutely i was very very privileged because of my friend mark's connections etc um and the very fast story to that in fact is how i came to be lecturing about it because uh, the movie was coming out with ron howard etc who was making a movie right. with Bank, et cetera, et cetera. And um, one of my pals in Texas who organizes these things said, oh, well, why don't we get uh, Judith Fiskin, who was the curator, Mark's mother, to come out in the lecture tour and so on. I said, okay, fine. I contacted Judith. And regrettably, she had problems with her legs and illnesses, et cetera. She won't mind me saying it. It's perfectly okay. And she then said, why don't you do it? And I said, what? Me? She said, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> no, she said, no, no, no. You understand people. You understand audiences. You know how to do this. You know how to talk and everything. I can't travel. I can't get on a plane. I said, yeah, but, you know, what gives me any validity to do it? I don't have any validity to talk about it. She said, yes, you do, because I'm going to give you all my videotapes and private papers. You're going to study it, and then you're going to go off and do it on behalf of me and all those people who need to hear about Rosslyn Chapel, the ley lines, the Magdalene, Longinus, the stained glass windows, and, oh, Lord, about at least another 20 or 30 topics which we have not even covered here. So as I speak to you from my study in a, in a wonderful box here, I have all of Judith's papers. I studied them, and then I went out and started talking um, as a layperson about Rosslyn. And the spirit often does. Um, you know, you, you get the help you need when you need it, and you go there and open your mouth and... It happens. <laughs> oh, yes. The yeah. intention and manifestation, it happens. Um, if your heart's in it and you're open to it, magic yeah. does does happen. So I do want to make sure we've mentioned this before, that you do have a gathering coming up that is um, I'm your part, dear friend I'm Michelle. Oh, yeah, with Michelle's gathering. Yeah. Michelle's, yeah. you are a part of it, though. Um yeah. So that's what I mean. You have a gathering. You, you are part of a gathering. Let's put it that yes, way. Yes. That is happening in Window Rock, Arizona. And it is in August, correct? Yes. Correct. August. Yes. Um, and uh, you can find out more information on gatheringofhealers.webnode.com. Uh-huh. Uh, and the other website is for your information that I want to make sure, and that's Dark Zone dash magic webnode.com um, to find out more information about you and all that you do. Um, 
you May have I think really. If I may, sorry, interrupt very briefly here. Of course. I, think I, I sent you one, um, which I cannot recall. I should do it. I'm useless at these kind of things. I really am. Um, I think it's Darkstone Chronicles, Esoteric. Uh, I'm almost certain you have that. That's the one where I have two articles on Rosslyn and the transcript of a TV show that I did about it. Uh, so if anyone's interested, probably that might be the good one for you to, you know, put on the, the, the Facebook pages or whatever. Uh, okay. That really does go into some detail. Oh, my magic magic part is not of great interest, I think, to anybody. It's, I'm just an entertainer, and that's it. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, magic is becoming more and more out there and prevalent, so magic is always good to see and to learn and to express. So, oh, um, absolutely. That's, that's the main thing I'm coming across here. Um, Anthony... You are an amazing man. Is there any final words you'd like to say? Well, final words sound so final, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> the, thought of, just, the final yeah. thought of the hour. Let's put it that no, way. I know, I know what you're saying. I, you know me. I love mischief. I love, I love playing around. Yeah, you, you got to laugh. You got to laugh. Final words, uh, as you say, to wrap this show up. Well, first off, I want to thank you and Dave. Um, that, Who's, who's done all the wonderful stuff behind the scenes. Um, and it's been such an honor and a pleasure to share a mic with you, Jennifer. It really is. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about passions dear to my heart. And, yeah, uh, words for people as we say bye-bye to them. Yeah, laugh. Laugh more. Laugh more. Laugh more. And respect, respect the sacred feminine doesn't matter if you're male or female. Respect the sacred feminine. Bring it yes. out within yourself if you're feminine. Uh, and if you're male, for God's sake, shut the hell up and learn. Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry to say, you know, sh- yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah, I'll say it again. Listen, okay, listen right. once in a while. It's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just learn. And I... women, please, please, learn how to teach men about the sacred feminine. But above all, while you're doing it, just laugh. Because it's fun. That's what it's about. Just laugh. Great it's words. It's the most spiritual too. thing you can do. Great things to ponder about and be is, um, you know, the feminine energy is is being strong and nurturing and very present, but a sense of humor that that's just makes humanity doable, um, livable at times, not to take anything too seriously, mm-hmm. and yet really respect everybody for whom what they are as they are um as everybody's going through this huge transition at, that we spoke about um earlier in the show and as i did with jason so i thank you again it is always an honor and a pleasure to speak to you um you are very you share a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge and i appreciate that so well, with thank that, you for your kind words thank you for your kind words jen it was an honor and a joy to share a mic with you Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, this is Jennifer Hellman with Abstract Illusions Radio. We hope you had a good time and learned something. Um, keep everything open, free, and beautiful. Until next time, have a great week. Another great show is coming up. And remember, this is donation base. We, we need your donations to keep this going. So if you like this conversation and this guest and you want me to keep bringing more people on, um, and keep things running on this beautiful radio station of Wolf Spirit Radio and Dave, um, we ask you to donate and thank you for sharing the love, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. Till next time.